Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Gabo. Uh, yeah, so this is a little bit about me, but I think you have seen my face around the conference enough. So, but this is my contacts, and you, I'll publish the slides. So, so as you see, I'm, I'm, I'm a partner with Dick Consultancy, and actually, what do I do in, when I, in my daily work? So I, uh, I, I work with clients, and uh, our, the promise from Kerning Week is we enable clients. We don't try to sell them PowerPoint slides. They are maybe 5% sometimes, but we try to enable them on the level they need. So my daily work is to train people, to consult on strategy, how to build um, data pipelines, where to go, and what uh, the possibilities of AI are. And uh, interesting, like how did I come to this talk, like AI for managers? Because actually last year, I basically had a, had a blind spot. Because my, my background, uh, a little bit more about my background, my first career actually with 27, I was a COO of an independent record company, so I know the management hat a bit and how we have employees and we had a software problem and we were not able to solve it. There was no software for our use case. So I taught myself programming and this is probably one reason I'm standing here nowadays. <laughs> so, um, so how did I come to this talk? It was actually, I talk a lot to people uh, at conferences, to data scientists, developers, engineers. Uh, I talk to clients, uh, I talk to managers, and, and actually what I found out is, um, uh, is, 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 is was quite surprising because mostly the tech is not the main problem. <laughs> so uh, it, it, so after the, all these good talks, and uh, like they were like honest and safe environments, um, and. Before I share what I learned with you on the perspectives, let me a little bit learn about about you. So, uh, who is like in more like a tech role, like developer, data scientist, or yeah, okay, awesome. and who's more like in a managing role? Okay, right, um, okay. So, uh, let me explain you managers then a little bit better. <laughs> so, I give you some perspectives. So. Um, uh, First, the data scientist slash engineer developer role. So uh, what I learned, uh, what people tell me when uh, I talk to them. Uh, many data scientists are frustrated in companies because they cannot live up to their full potential. Many tell them I'm highly trained, but I basically work as an analyst. Uh, um, they say the company is not well prepared for data science in general. They, it's uh, problematic to get access to data because nobody Everybody knows we should do something, but many people don't know how. Uh, also, uh, the, the, in, in especially in uh, enterprises being along for a while, uh, the whole tech stack is just like a big patchwork. Uh, so they were like 220 good decisions over like 40 decay, 40 years, but like now if you align them, it's a very bad decision now. So it's really, it's a patchwork. It's really hard to struggle. Also like people lack they, they, they miss people making decisions. Can I do this with the data? And basically, very often in a large enterprise, uh, to say, I don't know is the better option. Uh, it's not like, OK, let's try, let's dare, let's bring this forward. Um, so this is where what I hear from data scientists uh, in, 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 in companies. Um, but also, I don't want to generalize. It's not like a, a, every data scientist. So I also know happy data scientists. <laughs> and they say they have easy, access, easy and compliant access to data. Um, they have access to domain expertise in uh, their uh, uh, company, uh, so they are uh, uh, the company is aware. It's not just like okay, this is a, a, a data science problem. Let's move this to the data science department and solve them. Though it, it's teamwork with the actual department, um, so they work in teams. They uh, they feel they can drive innovation and also bring value for the company. Uh, and let me also give you some manager perspectives. <laughs> So I did some research uh, on that. What do managers actually do? So this is what managers actually spend time on. And you see, most of the stuff is uh, uh, more administration. Um, there is some, uh, and, and, and only a, a small part is actually uh, strategy and thinking about innovation. It's only like 10%, and I got this from Harvard Business um, uh, review, so uh, I think this is a very good source for that. And also, um, the, uh, the same in the same study asked, uh, uh, which skills do you think you will require? And this is also like, uh, 
very quite interesting because they think you read more read like digital te technology, data analysis, interpretation. So this is actually like data science is like one of the top topics, but you see like the people skills are pretty low. And I think this is a big mistake. And this is a big mistake. I, from my program programmer or data scientist perspective, made the same because all the tech I do is great. It's so innovative. We can change the world basically, like, like S3 startup can change the world with this tech. And I learned no, uh, uh, like working with people, like um, um, uh, making safe environments, like talking to them, like really having real conversations and not just like buzzword bingo. Um, it's, it's, it's a skill and it's something we need to develop and both sides need to understand each other better. And this is basically what the talk is about. So um, what I usually do is uh, I, I, I do a talk or do this very often. So let's Google it, AI for managers. And this is what we see. Um, <laughs> of course, it's my favorite white robot again. <laughs> uh, it's like uh, it's always like the same images you see at Google. But interestingly, what happens if you uh, uh, if you Google replacing managers? <laughs> so this is the perspective, and what uh, basically yeah, but basically Google does just, just crawls the web, and 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 and. and makes this information searchable. So actually, there's a lot of stuff around embracing managers with AI, technology replacing managers. And th there's a big buzz going on, like managers can just replace by AI because AI is super smart. And um, once you start to work with it, you learn that AI can do like, impressive things. But I've never seen a smart AI. Uh, the better, just like to have a better comparison here. Uh, I also did the same for uh, data scientists. So it's more like an open question, will AI replace data scientists? So it's really good. And actually, uh, it also fits to that our uh, data engineers are probably one of the best paid pe people at the currently. Actually, if you try the same with data engineer, there's nothing. Oh, wow. That's a safe spot. But um, <laughs> so, so to get, <laughs> to get uh, uh, like also to get perspective. So uh, basically, I think this is how uh, many people feel like when they hear about all the buzzwords. I mean, we have to see the cloud, the cloud providers are beating the drum. Oh, yeah, you can do data science with cloud providers. We have all these great tools and you can have Colab notebooks, Azure notebooks. Basically, they're all like Jupyter notebooks anyway you can have. Uh, uh, so, so, so they're really good and many, many companies started to like adapted from startups to promise products which are basically almost ready uh, and, and, and everybody is really moving at a really high speed. Actually, it's quite impressive to see open source tools adopted by um, uh, major enterprises at that pace. It's, it's pretty impressive. And so uh, in all that, uh, people, are, especially managers, because they, they, they never ha make their hands dirty like programming, so they lack the experience and the feeling and the real obstacles uh, we have to face when we try to realize a project. So uh, they're more like this, buzzword here, all Kubernetes there, Hadoop over there. And um, so I would like to um, introduce a little bit what where I and my team stand, how we solve this actually, on, on, or how we propose, also propose to solve this for the future because um, it's, it's, for us it's very important we want to enable clients. I don't want to sell ours. Uh, or something like that. For me, it's okay. The client has a problem. Let's enable the client, and no matter what. Um, so, um, one uh, big problem is actually tech, data, and AI literacy. Um, so, many people really lack a deeper knowledge about the tech. Of course, everybody has heard the buzzwords, but can you really describe it? Can you really? Um, uh, do you really know how important domain expertise is in the whole field? Because I, um, I, I think two years ago, the PyDay Davaso, um, one of the keynote speakers asked with all data scientists in the room, who is actually working on a project where the data scientist has domain expertise as well? And 20% of the people raised their hands. And I think this is also like very often misperception. You can just move the, like this is how many enterprises work. You have a problem and you try to move it to the desk of a colleague just like to get rid of it. And I think, or to another department because um, then we have less work. It's, we're humans, yeah, we have to see this as well. So you just give the problem to a data science department which might be allocated in IT and then uh, people trying to solve a problem but the, 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 the one question is, are they are really solving the, 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 the real problem? So the first question is always, what's the real problem? What do, how would we solve this without data science, science or AI? And I just want to walk you through some misperceptions I have learned in the field. So one misperception is bigger is better. So let's get in the Hadoop cluster 
um, because we have data. Hadoop can handle any amount of data. So we're in a safe spot. We even haven't asked the question, how much data do we actually have? So do we have a lot of data to deal with or do we have less data and maybe have more a complex problem to solve? This is like two very different technologies required. But also in defense of people, I heard it, companies born in Hadoop cluster before they had the first data scientist. But if you also, yeah, we all laugh from our perspective, ha <laughs> ha stupid, but actually it's not stupid. It's, um, it's just a different thinking. It, for example, think about you are a company producing things. You basically, you order the machine and then you, then you hire the people operating the machine. And machu for them, in the perception, for us, Hadoop is software. For them, it's probably more a machine crunching data. So, and there, this is like one uh, misperception. Or uh, for me, like, um, especially I uh, like uh, Hadoop. Actually, Hadoop, the Hadoop ecosystem is, is facing problems currently. There's like three companies, two merged. One has, we has problems. So it's not all like, uh, like uh, not everything's prospering Hadoop. So actually, it's, it's quite interesting what's happening there. And nowadays, basically, for me, the new Hadoop, which is also, uh, Hadoop is a great technology, don't get me wrong. For me, the new Hadoop is Kubernetes. If you go to a client, everybody says, oh yeah, we need Kubernetes. But yeah, we are just like building models and trying to solve the problem. What do you think we can solve with Kubernetes? So yeah, it's Kubernetes is basically, it manages all the machines and the resources and there's nothing we have to do. Sometimes it's really hard to stand up. Say, no, we don't need Kubernetes. We maybe just need one server to solve models to see where we're going um, to further the project. Of course, in the future, it, we will use Kubernetes, but we will use it when we go to production, when we have maybe 100 clients, 1,000 clients, million clients, we have to serve. Okay, then we need Kubernetes, but we have to focus on solving the problem and not solving the problems of Kubernetes because there's not one Kubernetes, there's Kubernetes on Azure works a little bit different, and Kubernetes on Azure or AWS and, or Google Cloud. So it's not just like, Kubernetes is the all-solving problem. And there's many updates and many things you have to learn. So it's not just like, click here, Kubernetes, everything's working. You need people to operate and have experience how to operate this as well. This is very often forgotten. Another perspective is data lakes are where there was. So um, we have a big company, we have a lot of data. So let's just put them all in a data lake and draw the data out of this. So we have this clean lake with all the data. We just like need a hub can just pull the data in or yeah, or as we basically describe. So basically we tell our clients, this is just like an abstract, it's just a concept. So a data lake can have in, involve many, many systems, file storage, databases, ERP, ERP systems, basically everything. It's more like a concept to think about. Um, but it doesn't really solve your real data problems because it only solves probably a storage problems and it maybe helps accessing the data. But still, you have to think about the company culture, where we come back to the humans, because you need a company culture, people appreciate data, um, also like safe data in the right spot, add metadata, the right metadata to the data they save, but I think many just throw them on some drive and it's forgotten and I know, I know companies that, they, that, that build like crawlers to basically to understand what they, data they actually have, because when, there's it's many people involved, so this is just natural. Somebody is more or less careful, leaves the company in, uh, in a good tone, in a bad tone, and more or less maybe is cleaning up or not. So actually, company culture can help. The governance of the data and also curation of the data is important. It's not just like, it's not a tech solution. It's again, a human. Um, we have to solve this as humans. We have to evolve, build a, a healthy culture. We also see uh, very often, well, we've seen this before. This is just just hype, sorry for the typo. So, and actually let me put some evidence to this. Here you see some covers of MIT's technology review. That's MIT technology review goes back to 1879 and MIT has, they, they, they put them all online. So we see 1985, we see technology automation, uh, fix them up automation. We see 1986, will artificial intelligence ever deliver on its promise? And in the middle we see like 1984 as experienced nowadays with Stranger Things. Um, another fun fact, now this continues actually, uh, there's something from the end of the 90s, can computer create literature? Um, and how to keep mature, mature industries innovative in 1987. So also like we think we're having all these new AI and data problems and perspectives and dreams what computers can do and help us build. And actually this goes like really way back. 
And um, uh, if you uh, if you had been in um, have been in, in uh, Europe Python in Rimini, also there's a really interesting keynote by Ka um, Catherine Germo. She actually told what people thought that in innovated AI because many people are not aware AI goes yeah, it's like super old. AI predates databases. Um, this goes back to the 40s. So there was always like obstacles. Yeah. Um, uh, the, and so there were multiple stops and dark ages or AI winters where uh, some, somebody important wrote a book and said, okay, the XO problem is not, it's not solvable, actually, and this put AI to sleep. But which were the challenges? Not enough data, not enough computational power. But we see as, com as the electronics evolve, software evolves, uh, we, we see more and more of these problems are being solved and we are now are uh, after basically uh, the beginning of the 2000s, um, deep learning um, researchers were like exots on these conferences. Now they are the superstars. Uh, so the times, the tides have changed. Basically, it's like upside down now. So you see, this is like a history, but actually it's like waves and then we, we hit certain limits until data, more data, or the technology and computational power solves And also, where do we actually stand with um, deep learning and artificial intelligence and machine learning because nowadays everything's artificial intelligence and yeah, okay, it's basically just this. Artif this artificial intelligence, basically the whole field with machine learning is a part and deep learning is another part here. So basically, this, it's not a new technology. Many people don't know, oh, we talked about data science machine learning like two years ago, it was a big hype and now it's, it's deep learning, is this something different? No, it's basically the whole thing, it's just in a family. Also, it's not actually new. And actually, all the, the questions and challenges, because actually I, uh, I visited uh, the a, uh, Applied Machine Learning Conference in Lausanne earlier in the, um, uh, the year. And actually, uh, Gary Kasparov was giving, uh, uh, was, was talking here. Who remembers or knows who Gary Kasparov is? Okay, okay, half of you. So let me give you a quick talk. Gary Kasparov was the superstar of chess. He was basically the, the what's it called, uh, Magnus Carlsen of its time. And you see here, and he was basically um, uh, uh, playing chess against an IBM computer. Basically, this is the very similar moments we experience with uh, the deep, deep mind and playing uh, StarCraft or solving Go nowadays. So at that time, um, many of the innovators of, uh, or like theoretical innovators of the technology we use here, like Turing or Norbert Weiner, Alfred Binet, they, they all thought, if a machine is able to, like chess is the, key, the game of kings, so once a, a machine is able to be the human in chess, mach the machines have, have won it. So obviously this was like in the 90s, and uh, Kari Kasparov was the brain's last stand, he was our last hope, and actually nowadays he's giving talks, actually he's also like saying, hey, this was a good experience, he's not at all against the text, he said, here's this great tools, and this is really great. Um, so, uh, so this is actually like uh, machine alpha go zero now with, compared to human chess. He, they also like where the concepts, as we you think, why not combine deep learning AI with humans? Um, actually, they had the same ideas then, like having like work with a computer to, to learn how to play better chess or uh, have strategies. But he also put it like, he, had a, he, he put a, like a really nice citation of Pablo Picasso also there. So computer, are you, computers are useless. They can only give you the answer, which is also something really nice to think about. So, so the problem very often uh, is the problem seems simple as well. If you look, if you look at yourself, being really critical, and uh, so uh, I, or other people, always keep in mind. Very often the problem seems only simple to solve because you actually have no clue and experience in the problem. Um, for example, um, you watch the video about some new technology, and after half an hour, the video ends, and you see, oh, I totally got what the people tell, told me. And so, until you go to your computer, somebody asks you, can you please reproduce what you have just learned? And then you will probably have this moment, oh, ah. Uh, again, what, like, because the brain actually is a very good in making us believe feel good. Oh, yeah, if you've understood it, it's like these cloudy ideas, and very often, uh, so this is nice, this is a nice experience, but we have to also be critical, say, okay, maybe it's also like our brains just giving us a good feeling and tricking us uh, a bit. So, 
very often we see over ambiguous uh, imagineering like okay we can solve this and this and this and that um, uh, we can uh, like for, for forecast uh, things without actually having experimented on it at all um, and also very often, because there's a deadline and there's some deliberable um, premature shipping of technology which has not really been well understood, just produces some output which, 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 which looks nice, but I think it's very important to, uh, to check that, um, to explain what actually models deliver and why, and whether there's a bias in the data set and whether it has an ethical standard as well. Uh, so it's, um, yeah. So there's also personalities. So, uh, because I have been bragging a lot about like managers now, let's brag a little bit of, about data scientists. So, uh, actually, uh, just like uh, last week, uh, I uh, uh, saw a talk by Peter Baumgartner, and <laughs> you see already, and he had basically built some really good personas for uh, projects in his work. Uh, he's working at a research in institute. So you see, there's like. Anodine Andy doesn't know the problem, but wants to uh, see what, what things can do. And you have Easy Ed, you have Show of Sarah, who wants, just wants to do AI. So uh, maybe you have a look later on at the slides, I don't want to go through all of them. But you see, it's always like really important also to understand what are the personalities of the peers and the team you're working, and also how to deal with them and to handle them, but also in a respectful way, because show of Santa wants to do AI, but basically maybe this is not a bad thing. She's maybe just like a curious person, like and she wants to do innovate, so this is not necessarily uh, a bad thing, but we have to basically agree upon, okay, step by step, use a minimal version first, and then improve and see how far we can get. Um, yeah, that's also a blog post, I put the link there. Um, and also, um, like for big enterprises, IE, I, I, <laughs> IT is the wrong track very often. So uh, I googled IT and I was very surprised. Um, so it, maybe it gets the tense how ID, IT department f uh, feel, but actually, uh, yes, uh, I, I didn't expect that. But very often, uh, data science and I, uh, AI projects are uh, allocated to uh, the IT department, uh, which is, I think, very wrong, uh, because data science and IE is research and development. So we need an open culture, a curious culture to learn things. We have to do experiments. Uh, we have also budget-wise prepare. Something might fail, but we have, might have another finding. Um, and it's, it's, it's not just like, uh, yeah, it's not just like, okay, buy this from Microsoft um, or any other cloud provider, um, and they solve it anyway. It's very different. Um, so uh, we also have to see what do we have in the data, which domain expertise do we have. Also, many companies actually also struggle that um, uh, senior people leave the company and we, we lose the knowledge and there's not new people coming. So it's, it's, it's not just like about replacing people. Actually, we are losing a lot of knowledge nowadays because um, many people, like uh, I think what well, I call the baby boomers, are getting, uh, yeah, they getting becoming pensioners now. So we, we have to deal with this as well. It's not about replacing. It's like basically also keeping the knowledge and keep things going. And actually, quite unsurprisingly, clients reached out to me and said, okay, we've seen your talk. So I've I have given different talks on deep learning for fun and profit last year and actually clients reached out and said, can you do this, give this talk at our in-house conference as a keynote? And I was quite surprised why, because I always feel like a little bit like, yeah, this is funny and experimental and I learn a lot. And where do you actually see the value for, for your people there? And they tell me, no, I think um, how you present it uh, is, is very good to make them understand the So I want to share a little bit of what I, I did. So if you have probably heard about style transfer, learn on a French comic and take a modern DC comic and apply it, apply this. So basically I drew a modern DC comic into a French comic style. And so, and you can also do like this, uh, take a Piazza de Fuerza in Florence, um, Google some Avengers, um, just copy and paste them, no Photoshop involved, just copy, paste and preview here on the Mac. And you, it's like a five minutes project actually, um, and apply style transfer. So I up, uh, so basically I trained um, an AI model to learn the style of the comic, apply this and said, okay, this is a nice picture. If we use the half the resolution of the input picture, so now the, the, the picture size is now half, it will look different, and also the style transfer will look different. If you, for example, you can also go and say, 
um, we take a higher edge contrast, which looks like this then. And if we put it there, also like the style looks a little bit different. But fun fact, for example, we can also use a black and white version. And if we apply the style, hmm, unexpectedly it's not changing so much. So um, here you have a really an, um, very good combination on input output levels to see, okay, data quality matters, which we will see in the next uh, demo. And also uh, uh, to have, yeah, mm -hmm. to have uh, a very good connection, input data, output data, model, and also maybe mistakes or artifacts being produced. So if you want to learn more about this, I've talked about this extensively last year's EuroPython, PyData Berlin, and also especially on the uh, audio stuff I'm going to uh, show you um, now in, uh, uh, just like in PyData Amsterdam a few weeks ago. So yeah, you can just Google me. So um, the next example I want to show you is Tacodron 2. Uh, Tacodron 2 is a neural net, which is a little bit more complicated. The, the key takeaways is you can just like take audio snippets, take the text, and Tacodron True will solve the rest. So uh, it basically learns on spectrograms. And this is what I did. Once upon a time, there was a little mermaid named Siren who lived with her stepmother under the sea. She didn't get to go out of the sea like any other. So um, this took like nine days of training. It can now read any English text without any cloud. And this is the equipment used. This is a very MacBook and an eGPU. Nine days of training with a very good data set. So this looks impressive. And I think, OK, this is my call for we have to experiment more. And also, I'm not trying to build like a speech synthesizer. But for example, we are discussing with the client we can apply this or like have like a transfer of this technology for, predict for a predictive maintenance co um, uh, project where sound is involved to see how the machines work. So actually, this experimentation is, was very helpful. But also, I have to point out, this is now, of course, my cherry-picked impressive example. Let me play you how this sounded like after 10 hours of training. What the hell? It was in the head. And then it knew the world rings. He did. And then it was in the head. And then the head he went. You see, like, this is like, after and that, we really could have really judged this, this leading anywhere. Uh, if you want to know more, check the videos out. Also, uh, it's really nice to explain AI makes mistakes as well, and they're sometimes easier to trick than a human. That's like this, this nice video. Uh, it was uh, research. So actually, this is about object detection, and the researcher on the right, the nice guy, hey, the, the, basically, he's not recognized as a person. For us, we see a person just like having this crazy picture there, and we see basically the object detection, which is basically a very good system, YOLO, doesn't really see him which is, okay, we have to also rethink how this technology works. Always I call it like, you have like expert idiots as an eye system. Um, yeah, something like that. So watch it, this on, on YouTube, uh, speed up a bit. So from, from, I think to, to, to sum it up, it's, 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 it's a lot more about people and the technology and thing because actually we need an open uh, space to discuss new, new, new technologies and everybody from where he comes from, from management, junior, senior, domain experts, and we have to get everybody on the same page. So actually, it's a big human challenge. It's actually a big, all of these projects are R&D and also like change projects. We have to give, get, we get everybody like to open up, ask questions, admit I didn't get that. So this is like a really big challenge and this is, uh, we need to put more power and, and energy into this. If we really want to further this technology, we have to uh, basically uh, involve people on any level and in many roles. It's also like um, another nice saying, as well, like another experience is if you do, for example, um, an IA data science project, um, uh, you uh, in, in, in a production industry, of course you have all the data. You never have to talk to anyone on the shop floor, as we call it, operating machines, but you can get like the best insights from people working with these machines for 20 years because they have like an amazing experience and they can tell you way more than probably the data or uh, make you, help you to understand the problem, um, the solution, and whether you're actually on, on the right, right way. And this applies to any time. So um, uh, this talk, my talks are never finished. So I'm, of course, I'm going to finish in a bit, but I like to learn more. So if you have any experience you want to share with me uh, to add to further iterations of this talk, please talk to me or also my, my, my business partner Ingo is over there. He's also he's he's the care bear in the company. So always like give us input, share the experience because I think it's very important uh, we understand each other uh, way better. So um, thank you very much.
Thank you so much. I think we have still time for one question. So, any questions? Wow, all questions answered. <laughs> no? 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 Okay. Somebody has an experience you, you want to share? Well? Oh, yeah, we need to work on the safe zones, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, but we can also talk later. I'm around at the conference. Uh, just like free feed to uh, ping me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.